Hello. Hello. Oh, that's very nice, very, very good. Now I've got to stay here apparently because I've got to be near this mic, so I'm going to try not to sort of head off across the stage. So I'm actually quite terrified of public speaking and I'm also not very good at maths. And as a child, I tried to learn basic, and I was told that I would never be any good with computers. I got one A, four Bs, two Cs, and a D at GCSE, and I left school at 16 to study dance. And I've got no relevant qualifications for anything that I do. So today, I'm here because I'm gonna talk about all this other stuff that we have to do when we launch products. And they're things that actually we're not qualified for, even if we're massively qualified for the thing that we're doing as, as a product. And they're things that we think that we're bad at a lot of the time, and a lot of the time the things that we actually hate doing. But as someone who's kind of made a career out of things that she was told she was bad at, I guess I'm quite in a good place to talk about all these things that we find ourselves doing. So, you take a product full time, or that's the dream, you want to get your product to something that you can do full time and you can stop doing these other things, and you think, it'd be great, I'll spend all day working on my product. And I'm someone who spends all day working on my product. Uh, my product's Perch, it's a small content management system. And we've been selling Perch for just over seven years, and it started as a side project for our web development business. It's pretty much all that we do, so, I get to spend all day working on the product, or all of these things. It sort of turns out that working on the product is this tiny, tiny part of what you need to do to maintain and run that product-based business. So you're gonna find yourself with a whole bunch of new things to do. And especially if you're currently working as a kind of service business, you work for clients, there's a whole bunch of things that appear once you swap that kind of swapping your hours for money for having a product which you're selling. And I can assure you, you will suck at many of them, you'll feel very unqualified for many of them, and that's actually perfectly okay. Because bootstrap products grow slowly, and so we get to learn stuff as we go along. But it does mean, because you haven't got this bunch of funding to hire people, that you as the founders have to sort of take on this stuff that, that maybe you, know, you wouldn't ordinarily do. And it isn't really that sensible for you to be doing, but there just isn't the money to bring someone else in to do it. So we're gonna have a little look at some of that stuff and things that I've learned as we've gone along with Perch. So the big difference when you go from selling services to a product is obviously you've got to sell something online. Um, that's actually got an awful lot easier in the last seven years since we launched Perch, mostly because when we launched Perch, there was no Stripe, and Stripe have obviously made a big difference in the number of people who've had to go out and get an old school merchant account. So things like Perch um, or an ebook or other downloadable software, you have to sell the thing and then you have to somehow deliver the download. You might also have to do things like generate license keys and so on, and hopefully you won't be um, expecting people to wait for you to email them a license code later. And then you have, obviously, software as a service where you could have to set up a subscription and allow access to the product. And that sort of stuff is relatively straightforward these days. It sounds really, really simple. And then, when we started with Perch, we priced and took payment in GBP only. We're based in the UK. But this was putting people off, and that was actually for two reasons. It was mainly, you know, people in America were looking at the GBP pricing, and they didn't quite understand it, because they're not used to buying things in pounds, whereas us in the UK were quite used to buying things in dollars. But the second thing, which we hadn't realized, was a lot of Americans were being charged quite a high price by their bank in order to pay in a foreign currency. So it was making us very expensive. So we had to offer other currencies. We certainly had to offer US dollars, and once we'd done that, well, we might as well offer Euro as well, so we ended up in three currencies. Um, you kind of have a couple of choices when you do multi-currency pricing. You can either have a dynamic rate, so you set your pricing in, in pounds, for instance, and then every day you just update it to the current dollar or Euro amount. The problem with that is if you have a product like ours, 
uh, where customers um, might quote for a build of a website, including our software in it, if the price fluctuates all the time, that's a little bit off-putting, they don't like that. So what the other option is really to set the price, and sometimes that means you're swallowing the exchange rate. Um, and post-Brexit, we were able to make Perch $10 cheaper due to the crashing pound, and we actually updated our dollar pricing, so it's now cheaper for Americans. So, while we're still in the EU, um, if you're selling products to other people in the EU and they have a VAT number and you're VAT registered, you can deduct the VAT under the reverse, um, reverse charge rules. Um, you have to make sure they've got a valid VAT number to do that. So then you have to have this whole system for validating these VAT numbers and making sure that if you don't charge someone VAT, you've got a valid VAT number because you're going to have to enter it in a horrible form in three months' time. So that's something else you need to add to this system. And then there's this whole VAT moss thing. If I sell perch to someone in Germany, I have to charge German VAT. If I sell perch to someone in France, I have to charge French VAT. So I need to have this fairly comprehensive location-based tax system built in to the system that sells perch. We don't just charge the right amount of VAT, but we also have to store proof as to why we charge that amount of VAT. And the news is that's happening worldwide. Other countries are setting up their own location-based tax and are saying, if you sell digital products to one of our citizens, we're going to expect our tax. And then, just as you think you've got it all sorted, you start to get emails from people who say, well, in my country, we don't often use credit cards. We don't have business credit cards. Can we pay a different way? There's a surprising number of people um, in the Netherlands, in Germany, who don't like to use credit cards. That's quite normal. You'll get people asking if they can pay in other ways. And then, if you're doing subscription-based products, you get this whole class of problems where cards are rejected and people have to go and update their cards and so on. Um, you get lots and lots of failures. Uh, you also get problems with cards being rejected for fraud. Uh, particularly if you're selling a low-value product, that's a common fraud pattern, is that um, you know, people will steal a card and then try and buy something small on the internet to see if it works before they go and spend a lot of money on it. So you get lots of rejections for fraud. You've got to be able to deal with that stuff. And then there's things like dealing with refunds. So something just as straightforward as I need to let people buy my product opens up all of this stuff that you have to work through and deal with. Um, a, a solution like Stripe actually lets you deal with a lot of that stuff through their APIs, but then you're very tightly integrated with Stripe, which can make it harder to move away, and we'll think about that a little bit later. So you need to think all this stuff through, and it's absolutely fine to make business decisions there and say, well, I'm not going to worry about taking payments uh, via other ways than credit cards, um, and just accepting that that means you're going to lose maybe some German customers who don't have cards and aren't happy to pay other ways. It's fine to make those decisions, but it's worth knowing that you're making those decisions and, you know, what you're potentially turning away by doing that. So once you can take payments, again, you know, as a consultant or a, an agency moving into products, something that can come as a real shock is what lots of small payments do to your accounts. Um, when you're used to, you know, sending out invoices for large amounts and then suddenly you've got this rush of tiny little payments and the refunds and so on, it can become very, very difficult. Um, here's just one of the problematic areas. So if you use Stripe, for example, now unless it's changed recently, you need to have real currency accounts for them to pay sort of multi-currency payments into. So in the UK, you can get these bank accounts, which are like dollar or euro accounts, but they're not real bank accounts. They're kind of a sort of pot in your bank where you can store dollars and euros, but you often can't make payments into them from external accounts like from Stripe, which means that Stripe are doing the exchange on their end and then turning it into GBP, which then goes into your accounts. However, unless you've had permission from HMRC, you may well not be able to do your VAT accounting with the same exchange rate that Stripe is using to convert your dollar amounts into pounds. It took me about three months, but I managed to get HMRC to agree that, yes, we could use that exchange rate. But stuff like that, you know, is not what you expect when you just start selling a thing and want to charge for it in dollars. 
And obviously, if you're using PayPal, you get this issue where you do keep it in the, in the currency it comes in on, and then at some point, you might decide, oh, well, I want to move my dollar amount to GBP and withdraw it to my bank account, and that would be at a different exchange rate again. You kind of need a way of dealing with all this, sort of normalizing all this stuff into your accounts. Um, we've done that by relying quite heavily on Xero, Xero Xero.com, an uh, online accounting package. I'm sure most people have heard of it. Uh, that allows us to use their API to create our invoices. And as I say, we're using Stripe's exchange rate when with Stripe payments. If we take with PayPal, we get the exchange rate back um, from zero. And so we're logging all of that stuff. And it's also doing all the reporting on that. Um, I don't know how we would manage without zero at this point because it's been so important. So with that, plus our own sort of custom system, which does all the backwards and forwards with the API, we're able to kind of keep on top of this. Um, it still takes me about two days uh, every back quarter to make sure that everything is sane before I fill in those forms. Um, but an awful lot of it is automated um, into zero. I would very, very much recommend that if you are at the beginning of a product journey, you have a look at making sure things like payments are coming into some sort of system um, automatically and that you've sort of ironed out any problems before you get a big rush of payments coming through. And then there's hosting. So obviously if you're running some kind of software as a service, then you've probably got that kind of deployment and the hosting and stuff all sorted out. But even if you're like us and you don't actually host anybody else's data but you sell from a website, there's a bunch of things you need to worry about there. And you might think, well, you could just put that up anyway. You could put on some shared hosting. But yeah, shared hosting is generally pretty terrible. I think most people here are technical and understand that if you use shared hosting, you share all the resources on the box, and somebody else's site can take yours down just by soaking up all the available bandwidth or other resources. And in general, hosting is never a place to cut corners. The difference between terrible hosting and Pretty good hosting is often really only a few quid a month. Um, but cheap hosting is generally pretty terrible. Because it's sort of obvious you want your site to be fast and available, but then there's more stuff opens out here. Where's your data being stored? And that's not just a performance issue. You might need for, to ensure that your data is stored within the EU at the moment. How's that data being backed up? Don't assume your host will have backups, even if they say they have backups. They may kind of have backups for if like, their entire infrastructure falls over, but you might not be able to access those if you just manage to delete half of your website. Backups need to be automated, otherwise they don't get done. And yeah, we can see the backups are coming in, that's very nice, but make sure you can actually open the wretched things and they're not just you're not sort of backing up some utter nonsense. Can you restore your application and all data if the worst happens? You know, set up a VM and see if you can you know, resurrect everything in there easily. And failures of this stuff aren't always major data losing dramas. Uh, it might just be that your database fails under load, your site goes down, if, if someone high profile on Twitter says something nice about you and all these people rush in and your site falls over and you've lost those people at that point, they'll not come back. So have something in place to monitor availability and alert you when stuff is going wrong. Um, you can chase your host or move host if you're seeing that's happening quite a lot. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff, we like Scout app which gives the uptime graphs and things when things balls up. Um, there's a bunch of links actually alongside of this presentation and that's, that's one of them. And make sure, you know, what is the disaster recovery plan? And that shouldn't just be how the hell do we get all this stuff back online again. That should include how do we talk to customers while we're getting it back online? What do we say? What's the kind of social media plan um, to make sure that people feel confident that you're doing something? Um, You'll know from when, when high profile sites fall over, it's often the way that the, the owners of, of that site, the founders, the way they talk to people is what makes or breaks that situation. People say, yeah, you know, they, they were offline for a day, but they dealt with people really well. Um, so it's important to have that in mind as well as just the technical, how on earth do we get everything up and running again? 
And in terms of getting things up and running again, use some sort of configuration management software. You can check an awful lot of your infrastructure into Git these days, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, whichever, you know, use something that allows you to redeploy your infrastructure somewhere else. And if that all made no sense to you, then make sure you get a host with proper managed support. It will look expensive on top of your normal hosting fees, but will save you an awful lot of stress. So somewhat related to hosting, here's something that I think is very easy to forget if your product grows from being some kind of side project. What assets do you have and who actually owns them? So we're actually no better than anyone, but because we're a husband and wife team, it's less of a problem. But when we created Perch, Drew just registered the domain names under his personal account rather than the company account, which I tend to have the, the keys to. Um, so our Perch domains are actually registered under Drew, one of Drew's accounts. And I keep saying, oh, we should move all those together and never quite get round to it. But I think that's quite common for, for companies. You know, someone starts up a little project, they just register the domain names, and then somehow they're not quite under the control of everything else, which of course can be a problem if that person leaves or just they lose access to that account or what have you. Social media is another thing. Who has the keys to those social media accounts? Facebook pages get linked to a person. Who is it? And can you get access to it? Who will get the reset email if you manage to get locked out of Twitter? This stuff's really important to your business. Most of us are moving over to TLS, um, even for your small marketing sites. So you need to keep an eye on when your SSL certificates expire. So a shout out from us to um, DN Simple because they sent out a very nice email listing when the things expire. And in fact, I know that on Friday, I need to go and renew SSL certificates because I got my email. <laughs> and that's really nice. And so it's having some kind of knowledge of when this stuff's going to happen. Otherwise, you know, everyone's coming to your site and getting horrible error messages and that's not great. Now, I mentioned at the start that a lot of these things are things that we don't think we're very good at. Who here thinks that marketing is their strong point? Yeah, you're my people. So I'm not a procrastinator, except if I try and schedule any time for marketing, because I kind of feel that time's wasted. You know, code is easier, isn't it? If you want to just like finish, you've got to write some, some little feature or, or if I want to do a blog post, that's easy. But actually marketing is kind of this sort of woolly thing and I don't really know what I'm doing with it. So I'm very easy to sort of put that off. And I think as well, it involves a lot of these soft skills that I think some of us kind of lack if, if we're nerds, you know. And I, I, I would count myself as that. Those kind of soft skills, they're not really my thing. And I think as developers, we'll try and replace things that we're told actually do work. And we'll replace them with things that we're good at. So that would be building some really cool tools to track metrics. And um, we'll, we'll do that. We'll build sort of little solutions for marketing uh, rather than getting on a call and talking to people. And we know that that is actually what works because the people who know what they're talking about tell us that works. But, you know, that's not really what we like doing. And so, yeah, you kind of have to make time to sell your thing. As I say, it's not my thing, and it's not many of yours by that show of hands. But one thing for certain, there is no one who will have the passion and the fire and the excitement about your product as much as you do. So use that as a strength. Get in front of people and talk to them about how much you like your thing and how great it is and all the things it can do and the way it helps people. We find that an awful lot of the sign-ups, the demo for Perch, people say, you know, we, we ask, oh, where did you hear about us? And an awful lot of those people say, oh, I saw Rachel, I saw Drew at a conference, and they were talking about Perch, I had a chat to you about Perch, and it sounded really good. That's the bit of marketing that we can do. And I think a lot of us can do that because we really do love our thing, the thing we've created, we're excited about it. And doing that thing, that's far better than sort of spending our time making a very detailed marketing master plan that we'll never roll out because that's, we're, we're good at that thing, we're good at the list making. Just get out there and talk to some people. So that's just a few of the things that, are, that are sort of start to unroll 
when we kind of think about the different avenues that we might have to go down as we're launching products. And a lot of those things involve tools and solutions and things which are peripheral to your actual product. And especially if you're a developer, the, the first thing you think is, oh, I'll build a solution for that. I'll build something that solves this problem. And a lot of the time, you should not consider building this stuff in-house. Because any development work that you do outside of your core product is really a distraction. You need to think about why you're wanting to build these things yourself. So, unless you're going to be paying the third party a huge amount of money, a bad reason to build things in-house is that you don't want to have to pay $50 a month for a solution that does it. Um, you know, the, the cost of building something yourself is going to be a lot more than that, and you lose the opportunity to be working on your product at the same time. The other thing we tend to do is come up with very specific requirements. Say, ah, oh, yes, but I'm, I must have this thing and nothing does this. It's like, well, is that actually vital? Or could you just work around it? Is there another way to work around it? And the other thing people think is you get sort of obsessed that, oh, well, having the best support solution, this custom support solution, that's part of our competitive edge. It's probably not. If an API for this stuff exists and it's already being commoditized, your customers are not going to care whether the functionality was built in-house or comes from another provider. It's not your core product. However, there are some very good reasons to move at least bits of your infrastructure in-house, especially as the business grows. Or at the very least, think about your reliance on third parties. I think it's really important to keep track of the dependencies you're creating on other businesses. If we take Stripe, for example, and they are doing an amazing job and a much needed job of shaking up the online payments industry and they're rescuing many of us from having to deal with legacy payment gateways. They're shipping lots of features. Things like managing subscriptions, they've got their lovely payment forms and mobile payments. They've recently rolled out support for calculating taxes and shipping. And that is all great, but you can find that a lot of your business processes are getting entwined in the Stripe API. Uh, we've recently launched an e-commerce add-on for Perch, where we need to give people the ability to use lots of different payment gateways. And what you find is that most of them do not replicate in any way what Stripe has. So having Stripe as a dependency, that's not a bad thing. But you need to know that you're not going to be able to quickly switch away without writing a bunch of code. And you might say, well, Stripe's not going to go anywhere. I don't need to worry about that. But it might not be that the API goes away. It might just become too expensive to use. Uh, this happened very recently. A lot of people had to move away from Mandrill with, I think, 60 days notice because their accounts were going to become far too expensive for them to use for the purposes they were putting them to. Um, you know, this person's saying that it went from $200 a month to $1,400 a month. I mean, that sort of hike could burn up all the profit of a, of a small business. Another thing is that the service might fail to support new legislation. Um, you know, we're in the UK, um, part of Europe at the moment. Um, we might use a lot of products that come from the USA, where they've got different laws. And they may well not know and understand the sort of laws that we have to comply with. Uh, the most obvious example of that is our friend Vatmos. And it was back in October of 2014, I was reading the government information about uh, the change of place of supply rules for VAT, and I was aware that we were going to have to start charging VAT at the rate of the customer. The, the, so if they say, if they were in Germany, we'd have to charge German VAT. I knew that was happening. And because I'm nerdy, I was reading through the documentation, and it sort of dawned on me that the only way you could use the VAT portal to submit your VAT MOS information would be if you were VAT registered. Now, in the UK, we've got this very high threshold. You don't have to register for VAT unless you meet the threshold, um, but you had to be registered for VAT to be able to submit your VAT MOS returns. And so I thought, that's going to force a lot of people into VAT registration. And so I searched on the web, expecting to find lots of accountants talking about this, drew a blank, posted a blog post, expecting that lots of accountants would tell me I was wrong, and I wasn't wrong and all hell broke loose. 
And it quickly became apparent how many people were going to be affected by this, and no one had heard about it. So none of the third parties were ready to help people um, with, with this issue. There'd been no campaign to alert smaller businesses to the matter. You know, and without turning this into a rant about the stupidity of people in power who really should have known that we existed, you can't rely on getting much warning of changes to the law. And you certainly can't rely on your third party to know about this stuff for you, particularly if they're not based in the country that you are incorporated in. And this is going to get worse post-Brexit because we're going to need to consider UK law a distinct thing to EU law, and we're probably going to have to comply with both. And if you want to know the sort of things being touted, here is a paper summarising the potential impact that the European Union's new general data protection regulation will have on the use of machine learning algorithms and people being able to ask why you have made an automated decision about them. And one of our Tory hopefuls would like all websites to be rated before publication. This could be implemented in some way online, whereby a website would have to have its content rated before being accessible online. I'll just leave that there. You can all start Googling for how to get an Irish passport. So, if you're relying on a third party for anything, can you get your data out in a usable format? Um, you know, can you export the information? Can you get that somehow into your system if you need to move away? Uh, a good example of that is how we use mailing services. So we used to use MailChimp, and what we did is we made sure that when we sent data to MailChimp into those lists, we also represented that in our own system, which meant that when we moved to Drip, we could import not only the list of email addresses, but also all the information for MailChimp groups, which then we used as tags in Drip. We use the tagging in DRIP now, but again, we ensure that the integration works two ways. So we're storing that information so we don't lose it if DRIP goes away or becomes too expensive or we decide to use something else. So actually using webhooks and things to keep a copy of your data locally is a really great idea because then you can move somewhere else. And it really is just a case of knowing these dependencies. Depending on these other services is not bad, it's a great idea. Use all this fantastic stuff that's out there, don't try and build it all, but know when you're doing it. And so I'd like to suggest that everyone implement some form of chaos monkey. Now in DevOps terms, a chaos monkey um, randomly stops services and to see if the rest of the app can keep going or will at least f uh, fail gracefully. Now, you probably can't automate this across all your services. That's probably not something that's worth spending your time doing. But you can use the Chaos Monkey as a kind of thought experiment. So you think of a service that your business currently relies on, something you use in support of selling or marketing the product. How quickly could you shift to using a different provider for that service or API? What skills would you need to do so? Would it be just your time? Would you actually need to hire in a company to do that development work? Does something else even exist? Is there a replacement out there, or would you need to build that yourself at that point? And would you actually lose any crucial data by doing so? And if you would, that's a really good time to think about how do we make sure we do not lose that information. You know, how do you sync up that? Even if it's just doing a periodic export of the information, so you've at least got it somewhere. Um, make sure you don't lose any data. And as you grow, keep doing this process because things that are okay when you've only got 10 paying customers that you know by name are not okay when you've got 10,000 customers. So you've got to keep on redoing this process and saying, you know, is this still acceptable at the level that we're working at? Adjust accordingly. A good tip is to look for dependencies that are built on top of standards, because that means you're not tied to one provider. So a good example of that would be if you're using cloud storage, pick something built on top of something like OpenStack. If your storage provider gets too expensive or the Brexit means you're not allowed to store data in that location anymore, it means it'll be easier for you to switch to another OpenStack compatible provider. Um, another example is using support software that just sits on top of your email. 
You've still got all that information, say, in Gmail, even if you move support systems. Uh, you're not losing anything. You can still search the stuff. And so it turns out there's an awful lot to do. I've just covered a whole bunch of stuff, and it is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, it might seem a little bit overwhelming, but remember that you don't actually need to be an expert. And we're all capable of learning and understanding far more than we ever think that we are. Whatever it is, it's possible to grok enough of it to get by and to know which questions to ask. But you do need to show up, and you do need to be willing to do the things that you don't like doing, to spend some time sitting with the things you're weakest at and learning more about them. You need to be willing to invest time to learn about the aspects of running a business. And I mentioned at the start that I'm not really any good at any of this stuff. Um, and I trained as a dancer. That's my background. But the thing about dance is it's a very technical medium. And there's lots of different skills that go into making someone a good dancer. So you get people and they're really good at jumping. They're kind of springy. And they can jump really high and it's all effortless. Dancers spend hours learning how to turn. You spend, you know, as a kid, you know, you spend this hours hopping onto one leg and doing one turn and two and three. Some people are just great at that. Other people are always just like, you know, a centimetre away from face planting. Some dancers are amazing actors, and in fact, a lot of the people who you might think of, if you know anything about dance, is like the best people, actually aren't technically the best dancers. They're just fantastic at really putting across a story in what is a silent art form. So when you learn dance, though, you spend most of your time in dance classes being told to concentrate on your weakness. You're doing the things, actively finding the things that you find the hardest and putting them under pressure. When it comes to casting a show, of course, you're put in the roles that celebrate your strengths. However, all that work on your weakness means that doesn't drag your performance down. You don't spend the whole show terrified about that bit where you've got to do all the pirouettes because you're going to fall over, because you know you can do them. You can't do them brilliantly, but you can do them well enough. And as it is in business, in all the stuff you have to do, there's going to be things that you're really great at, and there are going to be things you think you're bad at. So stare them down. Put yourself in positions where you have to learn how to do them, learn to do them competently, and then when you have to pass them on, when you're able to pass them on, you can hire someone, you're going to be in a position to be able to hire someone well and to be able to oversee their work, and also not to be in that place where if they leave, they leave you in a complete mess because you've got no idea what it was they were actually doing. You won't be the person who ends up in a terrible situation with cash flow because you just outsourced all that to the accountant and never looked at it and then realized that they weren't actually doing a very good job after all. And you'll also save a lot of money because if your stuff's in order, I mean, accountants are a great example. If you can keep your stuff in order, then your end of year will be an awful lot cheaper than if you send them a big pile of receipts and a big mess and expect them to sort it all out for you. And what I would say is I think you can learn to enjoy the everything else. You can learn to find fun and interest in the things that you thought you never were any good at. And I can tell you that as someone who is just a dancer and who is terrible with maths and computers, there's definitely confidence to be gained from finding that actually you can do things quite well that you never really dreamed of doing. Thank you very much. And all the slides and lots of resources are at that URL.